Hi guys, so we are gonna read chapter nine. Okay, and chapter nine is at a friend's house, um, at someone else's house, you have to follow their rules, right? At a friend's house, everything is uncomplicated. No one drops toys in the fish tank. No one cares if the cellar door is open or closed. And no one shrieks unless there is a huge hairy spider crawling up her arm. And they only have regular family rules, like no snacks right before supper, call if you're gonna be late, and homework first. But the best part of being at a friend's house is I can just be me and put the sister part of me down. Christy's room looks like a page from a catalog, the sort of shiny catalog I get in the mail and can only afford a toothbrush or a poster from. But Christy's new pink swirled curtains match the fat comforter on her bed, which matches the pink and blue rug on her floor. It's all beautiful, but what I envy most is the neat row of things on her bureau. Photographs, makeup, her jewelry tree, and a long row of nail polish bottles. Everything out in the open, not jumbled in drawers like mine, out of David's sight. Lying next to Christy on her new smelling pink comforter, I wish I wasn't wearing such an old sun faded t-shirt and that I had put on some makeup this morning. I think he's cute, Christy says. I force my gaze back to the teen people spread in front of us. The boy in the magazine has perfect teeth and stabbing dark eyes. Christy taps a little box that says, up close and personal with Jake. He says his ideal date would be a sunset walk on the beach and a picnic supper that she had prepared. He sounds cheap, I say. As soon as I say it, I wish I could stuff the words back into my mouth. But Christy laughs. <laughs> yeah, why can't he bring the picnic? If you get invited somewhere, you shouldn't have to bring the supper. She flips onto her back. I roll over too. Her ceiling is ordinary, plain white with simple square glass light in the middle. And then there's two hooks, like upside down question marks, holding nothing. I think Mrs. Bowman hung her plants there. Can you date yet? Christy asks. I shrug. I know boys from school and church, but no one I'd want to go somewhere with by myself. Well, not really by myself because he'd be there too. Oh, shut up, I tell my tongue. You should ask that boy you drew on a date, Christy says. What's his name? I shift my shoulders, pretending that I need to stretch so that she won't notice that I'm squirming. Is there any harm in telling me his name? They're not likely to meet. Jason doesn't even go to the same school as I do. Jason, I say. Hmm. My boyfriend and I broke up before we moved, Christy says. But I think Ryan likes me. His mom works at the community center where I volunteer. Did you know that the community center is sponsoring a summer dance? It's for kids aged eight to 17. You could ask Jason. You volunteer? I need to change the subject. Yeah, with the preschool day camp, it sounded fun when I signed up, but they want me to come every day now. And with going to dad's every weekend, I haven't had time to finish unpacking. I glance at our bureau to the framed photo of a man standing with a dog. My friend Melissa's parents are divorced. She's in California for the summer with her dad. My parents aren't divorced. She snaps so harsh that I gasp. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought that because they're just separated. Christy reaches up to twirl a piece of her hair with her finger. They're just taking a break for a while. It's so quiet that I can hear the birds outside and cars driving past on the road. Christy holds the very end of the lock of hair and spins it back, falling against the path of freckles across her nose. Wanna shoot some baskets? She asks, pushing her hair out of the way. I don't know which basketballs 
um, in, but it's in the garage somewhere. Sure. I can't help checking off a list of differences in each room we pass through. There's no locks on the doors, no little kid videos on the TV, no safety plugs in the outlets, and a bunch of cookies are left out on the kitchen table. No one's worried that someone will eat them all at once. Christy's garage is full of boxes, bikes, rakes, a snowblower, and a um, clutter of other things. We open boxes until we find her basketball. I hope um, you're not real good. Christy passes me the ball. I'm only kind of good. Me too, I say relieved. We play one-on-one -on -one until I see dad pull into our driveway with David. David runs up the walkway to our house, clutching his video. Hi, dad smiles, coming towards the fence. It's a nice surprise to drive in and see you next door, Kath. First, I've told him not to tell, call me Kath because it sounds too much like he's calling me a baby cow. And second, why is it such a, a surprise that I have a friend next door? You need to get David a new tape player. I set up for a shot. The one he has keeps pulling his cassettes apart and I have to fix them. I'm sick of fixing his cassettes. I'm Catherine's dad, he nods to Christy. It's nice to have you and your family in the neighborhood. Christy shoots the basketball. I'll see you? Definitely. I get the ball and I pass it to her, loving the hollow thump that it makes when it hits her hands. I'll be in in a minute, Dad calls. I need to get something from the car. I walk home, easy as you please. In the living room, I can barely keep from skipping past Mom reading the newspaper on the couch. Next to her, David shakes his hands with excitement as a video preview plays on the TV. Did you have fun? Mom asks me. The newspaper pages make a whispery sound as she folds them. Christy seems like a nice girl. I nod. David slaps his legs with his hands. Rated PG for adventure, action, and peril. Jason missed you today, Mom says. My happiness deflates like a balloon with the smallest tear. He said that? Well, actually... He said, what he said was, tell Catherine all gone stinks the big one. Mom looks over the top of her glasses, giving the long, what have you been up to, young lady, stare. Who's Jason? Dad asks from the doorway, a teasing smirk on his face. A boy at David's OT place. I watch Dad's eyebrows shoot upward, and I roll my eyes. He's just a boy. It's not like he's a boy or anything. Oh, I almost forgot. Jason sent you something, Mom says. It's in a bag on the kitchen table. PG-13, David shouts. Parents strongly cautioned. I stroll ho-hum to the kitchen, but I'm curious. On the table, I find a paper bag and I reach inside. My fingers touch something sticky, cold. I pull out a big bunch of carrots and a feathery, with feathery green tops attached. Untangling the carrot from the bunch, I imagine cinnamon and nutmeg in their cage, shuffling through the shavings, drinking from the water bottle. I snap the carrot in half. From down the hall comes a crazed burst of squealing, then a shriek. Quiet pigs! By the time I reach my room, David's standing in my doorway, his hands over his ears. Sorry, I push past him. Go back to your video. They'll stop in a minute. Cinnamon and Nutmeg jostle each other, their front feet as high against the side of the cage. Out of my way, fatso! Who are you calling fat, hairball? The carrot is mine! 
I tossed the carrot bits into the cage. And a shaven, and a shaving, flying scuffle breaks out. Finally settling into happy chortling and chewing sounds. A trickle of guilt curls through me. Why can't the world be simpler? Like it is for the guinea pigs. They only have a few rules. Crying will get you attention. If it fits in your mouth, it's food. And scream if you don't get your share. But I can make it up to Jason on Tuesday, and I already know how. And that is the end of chapter nine.